a little bit about racial things, maybe. So remember we talked a couple weeks ago about the wonderful books that we got from the Jackson County Courthouse. And this one is volume one, and it is cases that came before the Iowa Supreme Court when it was the territory of Iowa before we were a state. And we talked about the very first case in this book that was called Ralph on Habeas Corpus. Ralph was a slave. So after, after, after we did all that, um, Marilyn Cornelius brought in some wonderful, wonderful information that we hadn't known about Ralph. And so I just thought it might be interesting to go back and, and look at some of, these, some of these things. So for those of you who weren't here and don't know about Ralph, um, he was born Rafe Nelson in 1795. And he became Ralph Montgomery because he had to take the name of his slave master in Virginia. And in the 20s, he was described as quite a hunk of field hand. So in other words, he was a big, strong field worker. He was eventually sold to his owner's brother in Kentucky. And then in 1830, the brother sold him to his son, and he ended up in Missouri. And he ended up 60 miles south of the Iowa border when we were still a territory. Well, while he was there working in the fields, and he worked there for two years for this man, he heard about the boundless wealth of people who were mining in the lead mines around Dubuque and places like that. And, and in his mind, he could just see great riches. Well, his present owner, who was this Jordan Montgomery, was a, a really kind man. And he got him to agree and wrote out paperwork and allowed Ralph to go to the territory of Iowa, work in the lead mines, and earn $550 plus interest that he could buy his freedom. And so, as we said, Ralph went to work mining in Dubuque in Iowa territory, but the cost of living was so high that by the time he paid his room and board, he couldn't pay the $550 back. He could not pay his debt. Well, his kind owner in Missouri was struggling financially as well, so if you remember, he paid $100 to two Virginia bounty hunters to go capture Ralph and bring him back so that he could use his them as a slave again. Um, the bounty hunters got some paperwork that he was a fugitive, and they got a sheriff from that neck of the woods to go with them. They found him um, working his claim just south of Dubuque, they handcuffed him and threw him in the back of a wagon. Well, Alexander Butterworth, who was a farmer and a big political person in Dubuque, a uh, well-known in Dubuque, happened to be plowing in a nearby field and he saw this kidnapping take place. So he dashed to Dubuque and he notified Thomas Wilson. Thomas Wilson had just been appointed judge of the newly formed Supreme Court of the Territory of Iowa. And so the judge was irate, and he ordered the Dubuque County Sheriff to go and return Ralph to him, to the court. And so armed with a writ of habeas corpus, that's how that name got in there, the two galloped to the rescue. They got to the docks in Bellevue just as they were loading Ralph onto a steamboat to leave for Missouri. And they were able to reclaim Ralph. And the case came to the court, very first case to come before the Supreme Court, and it was decided for Ralph. And the court concluded that Ralph, yes, Ralph had to repay the money. He did owe $550 for his freedom, but with one key stipulation, and it was, it is a debt which he ought to pay, but for the non-payment of which no man in this territory can be reduced to slavery. In other words, he was standing on free ground, and he was no longer a slave, and they could not take him away. And then the Supreme Court declared Ralph a free man on Independence Day, July 4th of 1839. Well, isn't that a great story? It really is a great story. And so what we learned in the, in the information that Marilyn Cornelius found for us was that um, Ralph did a lot of things with his life after that. He showed up to work, for instance, every year, one day, in Judge Wilson's garden. Judge Wilson looked out his window one day a year later, and here he was working in his garden. And he went out and said, you know, what? And Ralph said that he 
wasn't working there to repay him for what he did for him, but he intended to work one day each spring for the rest of his life in the judge's garden just to show him that he would never forget. That was me. So Ralph became a leading and a, a very, well, he became a familiar figure in Dubuque. He lived there the rest of his life. He continued to mine lead, and the article says that he actually felt, found several valuable loads of lead. So he did well for most of the rest of his life. Eventually, he fell upon hard times um, and spent the rest of his years in the Dubuque County Poorhouse. They think that he was kind of maybe swindled out of his money. Um, he died on July 23. 1870 after contracting smallpox and he got smallpox because he helped nursing sick people in Dubuque's pest house and as you know before there were hospitals houses of pestilence the pest house is where they kept people with with typhoid fever and tuberculosis and all kinds of communicable diseases so he was there helping take care of the people and um, he became sick with smallpox and he died. And then he was buried in the city cemetery, which became Jackson Park in Dubuque in later years. And after that cemetery closed, Ralph's remains were among those moved to Linwood Cemetery. And they were buried in a mass grave. And I couldn't remember whether that was the one that, that our friend talked about when she talked about the Dubuque, you know, the hidden Iowa. They, that I, I can't remember whether that was the same cemetery she talked about in Dubuque having been moved, but he was then buried in a mass grave. Well, in 2009, just to show you how important this case has been through all of our history, in 2009, which was the 170th anniversary of this landmark decision in Ralph's case, um, a 30-foot sculpture was unveiled in Des Moines. It was right near the Supreme Court building in Des Moines. And it features, a, you can see the big ring there, it was made of limestone from Dubuque. And it was called Shattering Silence. And so this is there to remember this case and remember Ralph. And then back in Dubuque, something interesting also happened because October 1st of 2016, to highlight Iowa's ongoing role in shattering the silence on the issue of racial inequality, um, money was raised for a tombstone to place in Dubuque to honor Ralph Montgomery. So Ralph is, has made a name for himself. He'll never be forgotten. And I just think that that's a wonderful story. And so I'm really grateful for our set of books, or we probably wouldn't have, have happened on to all of this. Okay, so today, Our real brown bag lunch. We're going to be talking about um, a counterfeiter that was redeemed by patriotism. And I just wanted to, at the same time that Ralph was being tried, one of the notable people that was there was a man by the name of Honorable E. B. Washburn, and he was a he was a famous attorney in Galena. He was always at the trial, seeing what was going on. Today we're talking about E. S. Washburn, completely, completely different person. Just so we don't ever get them confused. And there's E. B. Washburn, um, very, very famous, famous man. And you'll see his picture and his story. It's all over the internet. This is not who we're talking about today. Okay. So um, everybody remembers Toni Cracky when she was here, the curator. Um, and she wrote this little book called Vigilantes, Some Committees of Vigilance in Jackson County. And there were, there were several. Um, you have to always remember Jackson County was the Wild West. And sometimes it's really interesting to look back at our history. And in this book that she compiled, she rightfully stated that some of the information is more misinformation than fact. So in reading some of these histories, you, you have to kind of keep that in mind. There's a couple of the Iron Hill vigilantes that we had in our, in our photo database. Um, they were probably the, the most well-known group. 
these men drew up res these men and their cohorts drew up resolutions giving themselves power to enforce the law because the law was few and far between. The sheriff was probably in Bellevue most of the time. There weren't cell phones. He had to cover a huge, huge territory on horseback. And so these men decided that they were going to be the law and they took law into their own hands. Um, their justice was often swift and it was often brutal. Quickly dealing with justice for criminals. And people at that time didn't know whether they needed to be more afraid of the vigilantes or of the criminals. Um, courts and other law enforcing agencies used their power and they eventually broke up this group, which about the time the Iron Hill vigilantes numbered about 400 people. And uh, they weren't completely successful. They didn't completely <coughs> go away. And I just thought it was, um, it was interesting, these law enforcement volunteers were subject to calls any time of the day or night. Judy? Were James and William related? I don't know. I do know that there's the Green Cemetery in Iron Hill, and the Green family was very prominent in Iron Hill. I don't know. I couldn't find that they were brothers. Do you know, Don? Uh, I think they were father and son. Father and son? <coughs> that, that, probably, that probably makes sense. Okay, so when if you were a member of the Iron Hill Vigilantes, you were subject to call any time, day or night. And they were remarkable because when the call went out, they were able to block every road in Jackson County and have it under guard within 20 minutes. Nobody got away that they didn't want to get away. And it was interesting that in 1940, the Jackson County Vigilantes, or Regulators as they were called later on, received a special commendation from J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI for the work that they did. So, anyway, Jackson County, old Jackson County, has an amazing history, and we have to remember that it has a very diverse topography. Remember to the east, over by Sabula and over that way, were the huge prairies of prairie grass that are documented to have been over 10 foot tall in some places. And there are stories of pioneers going on the road, well, there weren't roads, but going back and forth, and their wagons would pass each other, and they couldn't even see each other because the prairie grass was so tall and so thick. So that was that part of the country. but. Um, and, and there were no, there were few trees, so there weren't log cabins very often over in that part of, of the country. Instead, they had sod houses and that sort of thing. So it was different, different around Jackson County. Um, conversely, the land to the north and the west of Maquoketa, between the north and south forks of the Maquoketa River, that land was known as the Big Woods, and it became very, very well known. Um, of course, this is a later picture. But uh, it was one of the heaviest, heaviest bodies of timber in the state of Iowa. It had tall, wonderful hardwood trees and very thick underbrush. And this is mostly, if you, if you think about the Brandon Township area, this was mostly in the Brandon Township area. Um, Brandon Township was created in 1843, so we're still talking about that time period before Iowa was a state. And they said that it was all it was ideal for really early settlers because there was very fertile soil, some of the most fertile soil that was anywhere in the United States so far. Numerous springs and streams and rivers and the caves that we talked about not very long ago, and that provided food and shelter and warmth for the people. But on the other hand, the Owen Gazetteer and Directory of Jackson County of 1878 states that in the early days, desperados settled in the big woods along the Maquoketa. And that was, and it's hard to think of this this way now, but even back then, this was a large, large organized crime ring. They had countless Confederates. They had up and down the Mississippi and Illinois and Missouri at all, all points. They had their little concentrations that they worked out of. And of course, it's thought that their headquarters for everything for a time was in Bellevue, Iowa. And that's, uh, you know, we've all heard about the Bellevue War that was, that was fought on the 1st of April of 1840. 
So most of the things that these people did, they were known mostly for their horse wrestling, um, stealing horses, and passing counterfeit money. This was their, this was their big, they were chief crimes is what they called them. But they didn't hesitate to commit murder if there were attempts made to arrest them. So law enforcement pretty much left them alone. And they would hide, as you can see, some of this, some of this wild territory. They would hide, um, they would run into the, they would run into the woods and hide. The woods were so thick that they couldn't be tracked, they couldn't be found, and so they almost always got away. So a lot of this information is in the, the Bellevue War, 1840, and there's our first sheriff of Jackson County, Captain William Warren, who tried to, tried, tried to keep law and order as best he could. Um, as you can see, he served from 1838 to 1844, and he's remembered mostly for the Bellevue, for the Bellevue War, because that happened on his watch. But something that you're going to be hearing a lot about, I hope, as we get into our muster on the Maquoketa and our Civil War reenactment, is the huge part that this man played in the Civil War. He was a quartermaster, and he supplied three different armies for the Union. Supplied means furnished so that they had uniforms and food and weapons and ammunition, and he, he was just... He was just a fantastic man, and it's 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 kind of sad that he's not remembered for some of that, and people just think, oh, William Warren, first sheriff, Bellevue War. So uh, we need to talk a little more about about him. As you know, the Bellevue War, there were more people killed in the Bellevue War, April 1st, 1840, than at the shootout of the O.K. Corral. So the the gangs were the gangs were here. And it was a huge counterfeiting ring. So I just, there's not many pictures back then. This is just to kind of give you an idea of where things were. So we're talking about the big woods that were between the, the forks of the river, pretty much in this area. And just, just so you can kind of, kind of think about where things were. Um, that is, again, over where Don Thomas' T-Bar Ranch was, over near Canton, as part of the Big Woods. You can see how difficult it would be for law enforcement, for a posse, anybody, to track people in this kind of, in this kind of territory with the thick, heavy brush and the tall trees. And there's another picture over by the Ozark Wildlife Area today. But it just gives you an idea of what, what this, what this territory looked like back then. Um, counterfeit Cave, and that supposedly is a picture of Counterfeit Cave. Counterfeit Cave in the Big Woods is also really well known in the, the history of this area. And it's interesting to me, not very long ago, and when I say not very long ago, it's probably been a couple years, um, some people came in that had owned property in Emmeline where some of these things went on. And out in one of their fields, they found what appeared to be some coins, some counterfeit coins, and some and an engraving plate. And so um, it's just, things turn up. Things keep turning up. Early historian that we talk about a lot is Levi Wagner. And in the Annals of Jackson County, Volume 1, um, he tells the story of a man by the name of Oren Sinke. Warren Sinke was a, was a resident of Emmeline in 1855, and he owned a team of beautiful matching horses. And one day, he tied them to a fence in front of his cabin, went in to eat his breakfast. And when he came back out, one of the horses had been gone, and the halter strap had been cut, so his horse had been stolen. Well, he ran for help, and he set out to catch the thieves in the big woods. And the big woods, it said, started just 40 rods from where he had tied his horses up. But the trees, again, were tall and the underbrush was dense. And they did manage to track them to Pine Creek before they lost the trail. They searched and searched without success. And they finally decided that the horse was being hidden during the day and taken across the river and away when it was dark. And 
as they searched, they finally came across a cave a half a mile from the river that was large enough to hold several horses. And they could tell by the tracks there that that's, they had been there with his horse. And it was only a short distance from Counterfeiter's Cave. It was very close to here. Um, the Annals of Jackson County has awesome stories. And it also tells about another adventure that this foreign sinky had. Um, because back in the territory at that time, there were no herd laws. Of course, that meant so that the cattle and the horses and the hogs, everything just ran at large. You didn't keep track of your animals. You kind of checked on them every now and then. And sometimes when you went to look for them, you found them miles away from home. Well, Orrin Sinky and James Cooley from the Emmeline area were searching for some missing cattle that they hadn't seen for several months. So they were out looking for these cattle and they thought that they would find them down by the south fork of the Maquoketa. So when they got down there, they couldn't see any sign of them. They followed again Pine Creek, about two and a half miles up. And they, they came to an area where the bluffs on either side of the river were from 75 to 100 feet tall, these limestone bluffs. So they decided that the only way that they were going to be able to see anything was if they climbed the bluffs and they got on the tableland so that they could look down over the area and thought that perhaps they could, they could spot their cattle from above. Well, when they got up there and they looked around, they saw a thin column of smoke coming out of a crevice in a, table of, in a, in a ledge of rocks. And so they made their way down to it and they began searching. They found a, what they called a dim path um, among the rocks and it was leading to a cave that was entirely hidden from view. Couldn't be seen from down below looking up. It couldn't be seen from up above looking down. But they, they found this cave, and inside the cave, they found dying embers of a fire. Somebody had been there really recently, and the smoke was still, still going up. They looked around the cave, and they saw fragments of what looked like silver, and they found a number of imperfect coins. Somebody had been making silver counterfeit coins, and they tucked them in the crevices, the imperfect ones, they tucked in the crevices of the rocks on the side of the cave. So they hurried, they gathered up some of the coins, and they made a hurried escape. And they were pretty worried because they thought the counterfeiters could well be out there in the brush laying in wait. And they knew it was no longer a healthy place to be looking for cattle. So they gave up on that. They got away as soon as they could, but they told everybody in the area what they had found. Well, there was a man by the name of Nesba, Nesba Alden, and he lived at Four Corners, or Alden's Corners, which were two early names for Emmeline. Um, he'd come from Ohio. He's kind of a hermit, but he was very, very outspoken. And for a long time, he had been talking about the fact that there was a nest of counterfeiters in the big woods and that they needed to be ferreted out and they needed to be dealt with according to the law. Well, he made such a, say he was making so much noise about this that when he was working in his timber a couple days later, um, someone shot a hole through his hat. And all I did was take out a few strands of hair, he said, he wasn't really hurt. But uh, he turned, he saw a man running away and so that incident of him being shot at and finding the cave, um, I think was all they needed and that gave rise to the Vigilance Committee of 1853, formed two days later. They decided, okay, it's time to do something. So if you fast forward a little bit, also in the Jackson County Annals in volume three, there's another story about a band of counterfeiters in the big woods during territorial days. It was in the fall of 1858, and well, it wasn't a territory by then. In the fall of 1858, two Farrington boys and a man by the name of E.S. Washburn were arrested for counterfeiting. Washburn was found with counterfeit coins in his possession, and he was also found to have dyes for making these coins, for making such money. So the dyes were of a really hard metal, and they would take coins and pound them in, um, reshaping them, making them into something that they weren't. And so um, he, he and the, the two Farrington boys were arrested. They were indicted, tried, and convicted for manufacturing and passing 
counterfeit gold dollars near Canton. Washburn was sentenced to one year in the penitentiary. But there were a bunch of neighbors that thought that he was innocent. And there was a man by the name of Myron Collins. He was bailiff under the sheriff at that time, which was James Watkins. And he had charge of Washburn and the two Farringtons when the county seat had moved back to Bellevue. So the jail was in Andrew. They had to be taken to Bellevue for court. And so they had to be guarded while they were in Bellevue. And so this Collins that we're going to be talking about was the man that guarded them. Okay? And during that time, that it was quite a time that this was happening, uh, he became very familiar and probably friendly with Washburn. And he believed in his cause. And after his conviction, Washburn wanted to take his his trial on appeal to the Supreme Court of the Territory of Iowa. And that appeals court was to meet in Davenport in the spring. So Collins and his seven neighbors put up a $500 bond for Washburn. And Washburn moved his family to Bellevue, and he lived there with his family until spring. And when spring came and it was time for his trial, he boarded a steamboat for Davenport, or so the authorities thought, but instead, he disappeared. And the county made no attempt to collect the bond money. They preferred to give the eight men ample time to try to find this guy. $500 was a lot of money, and they knew that they'd be, you know, they'd be looking for him. Well, time went by, and they, they found no sign of him. So it took the Civil War to find this outlaw, E.S. Washburn. They had heard nothing about his movements until a few days after the Battle of Pea Ridge. Um, the Battle of Pea Ridge was the 7th and 8th of March, 1862, and it was heavily Jackson County men that fought in this battle. Well, Collins, our bailiff, received a letter from one of the Farringtons who had been let loose, and he, um, he let him know that he had seen Washburn, and he was then, Farrington was then serving in the 9th Iowa Infantry at Pea Ridge. But he reported to Collins that he saw Washburn, and Washburn was the major of the 24th Missouri Cavalry under the assumed name of E.S. Weston. So he just conjured up a new name, and he was in the middle of things. Collin got, Collins then got a requisition from Governor Kirkwood and he immediately left to pick up, to pick up Washburn. Clean my things here. There's the Battle of Key Ridge. Um, he he went to Arkansas to pick up Weston. He delivered his requisition to Governor Phelps, who was the governor of Arkansas, and rode in the governor's carriage to to Helena, Ar to Arkansas, to talk with General. Curtis, and I think I have a picture of General Curtis. General Curtis was the Victoria, victorious commandant of the Union forces at Pea Ridge. He's the man that got the credit for winning the Battle of Pea Ridge, which turned the whole tide of the, of the Civil War in the Union's favor. It was a very, very important battle, mostly Jackson County men. He was waiting in the carriage while the governor and the general met. And as he sat there and waited, who should walk by but Major Washburn. He was on his way because he too had been summoned to come before the, before the general. So Collins just casually said, hello, Washburn. And Washburn turned around and looked at him, he said, for several moments before he spoke, saying, great God, is that you, Collins? I suppose the jig is up with me. And Collins told him that he thought it was. And Washburn said, well, I suppose you're after me. And they talked for a few minutes before being summoned before General Curtis. So General Curtis was absolutely astonished when he heard the charges against Washburn, saying that he would rather part with any other officer in his command than Washburn. The Battle of Pea Ridge, he insisted, might easily have been won by the Confederate forces had it not been for the strategy and the gallant conduct of Washburn and his regiment. Washburn had served his country in the Mexican War, and Curtis regarded him as a highly disciplined and daring military leader and strategist. 
That's our kind of flu. <laughs> so, the bottom line is that General Curtis was very, very anxious to make some arrangement whereby the Major could be retained in the service. Um, he sent two of his, his trusted staff members, and Collins and the Major, to a room upstairs over the General's quarters, and after a long consultation, they finally agreed to the following, that the Major should have to pay all the travel expenses of Collins, both coming and going from Iowa to Arkansas to back, as well as reasonable compensation for his time, and that he should deposit $500 bond money, the people were out, with Governor Phelps. And Collins, for his part, was supposed to get up a petition to take to Governor Kirkwood of Iowa, setting forth the gallant services of the major at the Battle of Pea Ridge and elsewhere, and asked the governor, Governor Kirkwood, Governor Kirkwood of Iowa to pardon him. Well, the petition was signed by General Curtis and his entire staff, signed by Governor Phelps of Arkansas, and at the time, our major, our counterfeiter, was uh, <coughs> serving as provost marshal, which is just kind of ironic. He was provost marshal, so Collins asked to be allowed to go out to the field and visit the 9th Iowa. So the major arranged for a horse and equipment and told him that he could stay as long as he wanted. So he went out to the, he went out to the field and he visited the men that he knew. There was a company from Andrew there that he met, he knew men, and one from Bellevue, and he had friends in that. So he spent two days visiting with the troops and he said he was treated like a king and he had a wonderful time. At the end of two days, he returned his horse to the major and he took a steamboat to Cairo and went home back to Bellevue and then to Des Moines to deliver this petition to Governor Kirkwood. Well, as you can imagine, Governor Kirkwood was only too happy to grant the petition, the pardon, because, and he did so without any hesitancy, he stated that we need every man in the Army who can do any good. And there was no doubt that Washburn, Washburn was worth more there than he would be sitting in a penitentiary. So he pardoned him, and he just, I suppose no one there really knew, and he just continued his duties and, and went on with life. Well, during this little talk that they had sitting in the carriage at Helena, Washburn had told Collins that after leaving Bellevue on a steamboat for Davenport that spring, he had gone instead to a town in southern Missouri. And that while he was there, which was a, quite a little bit, he had been very successful practicing medicine. <laughs> oh, gosh. But he was a very talented guy. But when the war broke out, he got up a company that was attached to the 24th Missouri Cavalry. They elected him major. He drilled the reg regiment and had total command during the campaign at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Well, knowing that Washburn's family in Bellevue knew nothing about his whereabouts because they saw him off, I'm sure, in the steamboat, never heard from him again. All the time he was in, in Arkansas, Collins uh, went to see them and informed them of what had happened, told them about his pardon, and so Washburn's family left as quickly as possible for Helena, and nothing was ever heard from them again. So we assume that they became the family of C.S. Weston, Major Weston, and that Washburn just kind of disappeared from the... <laughs> but what an interesting fellow that he, could, that he could do all of these things. And it tells you a little bit of something about the Civil War, which we're going to be thinking a lot about in the next several months. Um, the kind of men that fought in the Civil War. I mean, there were a lot of patriots, but, but here we have quite a few criminals just in our, just in our little stories today. Um, so anyway, this is, this is just the story of the, the counterfeiter from the big woods that was redeemed by patriotism. And so I just think it's important that people here know that the Battle of Pea Ridge was such an important battle. It played such an important part. And Jackson County men, even their counterfeiters, <laughs> made it all happen. And we should be, you know, we should be very proud, proud of our part <coughs> in the Civil War. So 
Our men were mostly in Company A of the 9th Infantry. And Company A had a battlefield, a battle flag, I'm sorry, a battle flag. And there's a wonderful story about how this battle flag was saved and returned. It eventually, mm -hmm. it went back to Virginia? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, thank you. So originally the company didn't have a battle flag. And so there were two ladies in Massachusetts that made a battle flag, I believe, for the ninth. And so after the war, this battle, this with, with blood stains, et cetera, was returned to the two ladies. And they, they wanted to keep it. But finally, one of the ladies died, and the sister maybe returned it to um, the State Historical Society. It made it way back to the State, of, State Historical Society. They did testing on the DNA testing recently on the blood that was on the flag as they restored the flag. The blood was too deteriorated for them to make any, to, you know, for them to say anything specifically. But um, this battle flag is with many others that have been on display from time to time at the state capitol. Okay? And it's, of course, part of the collection of the State Historical Society. So Don and Helen, Helen Rockroar, have been on this. We've talked to the um, curator that at the State Historical Society. I've got a phone call scheduled with him. And we hope that we're going to be able to have this battle flag. This is a very, very precious thing to many people, as you can, as you can believe. And they're going to be very careful who they loan it to. But um, we think we've got arrangements made where maybe they're going to let this battle flag come um, to be part of our reenactment. It's not going to be able to be at the fairgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. But um, maybe at the courthouse where people can go and see it and, and learn the story of the of the battle flag of the ninth infantry peerage. So you'll be hearing more about this, I'm sure, as, as time goes along, but we're really working hard on this. And <laughs> Helen Rockwar has has done an amazing study about this and has just gotten so in, so much information um, about it. And it's just a, an amazing part of our history. So don't forget, next week, brown bag lunch, we're going to be talking to, talking to Henry Wallace, right? And I'm sure you'll be able to ask him questions, et cetera, et cetera. But it should be a wonderful program. So I hope that everybody will be here for that. Thank you for coming. See you all next week.